Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So hello and welcome to the final component of this course, Gender and Literature. So we've covered some literary texts, we talked about certain critical theoretical terms, we talked about the, uh, you know, certain of the key words in gender theory, uh, in gender and literature, and then we talked about, obviously we, we, we studied, examined some literary texts, uh, some very selected literary texts, uh, which we chose for a study, uh, which sort of reflected uh, some very complex representations of gender in certain social situations, certain political situations, certain ideological situations, etc. So, as you know, the texts which we have covered already, they include uh, Shooting an Elephant by George Orwell, uh, Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad, The Fly by Catherine Mansfield. Uh, the first text which I did was, of course, Munshi Premchand's Shatan Shakilari or The Chess Players. Uh, and then, of course, uh, we did Look Back in Anger most recently, which uh, was a very important piece of drama, a piece of theatre which examine the very complex relationship of gender and political identities in a certain kind of political ideological climate. Right? So hopefully by this time you have an overview uh, of the content of the course, you have an overview of the theoretical premise of this particular uh, kind of study, this particular kind of research, gender and literature. We have an overview uh, of the very complex relationships between society, uh, you know, uh, you know, identity, gender, ideology, etc., and how these identities, these, these correlations, these complex entanglements, how they are, those are mutable. So these are something which are constructed uh, by certain economic, political, cultural conditions, and obviously, uh, whatever can be constructed can also be deconstructed by certain changes in those same conditions. Right? So we talked about how gender is not really an abstract phenomenon, but a very complex material phenomenon. It is something of a, uh, uh, an entanglement between abstraction and materiality because it is informed in many ways by economy, it is informed by many ways uh, by some very material apparatus uh, which sort of uh, configure and reconfigure gendered identities. So what we will do in this particular uh, segment which is the final segment for this particular course, uh, we will look at how gender is represented in popular culture. Right? So, how the very complex uh, identity formations, reformations in popular culture and to what extent are these formations, reformations uh, sort of uh, identified or should be identified or examined through the material apparatus of the culture. Right? So, for instance, we talk about economy, we talk about consumerism, we will talk about um, and a big part of what we will do now is looking at advertisements uh, and how advertisement is consumed, how media is consumed, so how media in turn creates gender identities and how gender identities play up uh, in, in, in representations in media, etc. So obviously media is something, uh, popular media is something which we consume every day, uh, you know, sometimes consciously, sometimes unconsciously, but a big part of what we are, a big part of, you know, what, how we behave, what we say, how we think uh, is sort of the premise uh, on the way we consume popular media, right, and the way we consume popular culture. Right? So, we talk about how advertisements uh, sort of address a certain kind of population, advertisements address a certain kind of sentiment, advertisements um, you know, create a certain kind of effect uh, and obviously we have spoken a lot already about the very complex relationship between gender and effect uh, which is something which you saw directly uh, in Look Back in Anger and also in the other texts which we studied and how uh, you know, gender is basically you know, very interestingly uh, dialoguing with affective identities, so identities created by effect. Uh, effects such as you know uh, emotions of awe, fear, reverence, um, you know love, etc. Uh, effects of association, effects of disassociation, etc. So all these things come together uh, in creating and recreating gender identities. So gender, of course, as we know by now, hopefully, is not really something which is out there. It's a text. It's a very material text which is premised, which is configured by some very material apparatus, right? And what we do in this particular course, what we have done to a, to a certain extent already uh, in this particular course is we have identified and examined the apparatus which creates a certain kind of gender identity in a certain kind of cultural climates. So, there is no such thing as the gendered identity as a know by now. 
And there are different kinds of gen identities which are obviously pluralistic. They're premised uh, on certain cultural conditions. They're contingent on certain con cultural conditions. They're performative. And obviously, they, they're reliant on the way we look at identity formations and reformations. Okay? So having given you this sort of a preamble, we'll now move into what we will do in this particular course, um, the last segment of it, that is looking at advertisements. So advertisements, as you know, before I move into, I dive into the certain the specific advertisements which we will look at in this particular segment. Advertisements, as you know, is basically some kind of a, a speculum of consumption. It's a mirror. A speculum. The word speculum means mirror. It's a mirror for consumption. It, it sort of reflects in a very interesting way, sometimes in very uneasy ways, uh, the way we uh, consume uh, the culture around us. Right? And obviously, the way what, what consume over here uh, connotes, it carries connotations of commodity formation, it carries connotations of how the human body, the human mind, the human uh, identity is commodified endlessly uh, and then obviously uh, consumed subsequently uh, in cultural media, in popular media, in political media, etc. Right? So, what we'll do now is we'll look at, uh, you, know, you know, obviously, you know, we will look at a variety of advertisements, but more specifically, there are, uh, you know, some key texts that we'll study, and obviously the word text uh, is, uh, you know, is very, very complex because you know you can use the word text. We're talking about literary texts. We're talking about you know pieces of literature, pieces of films, pieces of cinema, uh, advertisements, music pieces, etc. So anything which can be analyzed, anything which can be examined, uh, and then deconstructed, uh, should be considered as a text. So in a way, if you use the definition then uh, if you use the definition in terms of gender studies, uh, the first thing, the first idea that should be triggered by the definition is that gender itself is a text. Right? It's a very textual uh, formation, it's a very textual construct. Uh, and obviously, uh, because it's a textual construct, it, it's dependent on the context, it's dependent on uh, the cultural conditions which produce it. Right? And obviously, because it's been produced, because it's manufactured, it can also be unproduced or manufactured and reproduced and remanufactured. Okay? So, gender identity obviously is a very playful performative identity, as we have seen what we discussed very briefly, Twelfth Night by William Shakespeare which is a very complex drama about different kinds of identity formation uh, in a very, very uh, sort of mutable, plastic, performative space of gender. Okay? So, uh, advertisements, as you know, um, they, are, they, they rely a lot on performativity. Advertisements, they try to produce an effect uh, and they also try to produce effective identities. Okay? So, uh, identities which rely on effect, effects such as you know, different kinds of emotions, different kinds of you know, sentiments, uh, sometimes the, the effects are created deliberately, they're designed deliberately uh, to create sentiments of affiliation, uh, sometimes they're designed deliberately uh, to create sentiments of disassociation, moving away, uh, sentiments which sort of repel you, uh, the sentiments which attract you. And obviously, when you're branding a product, when you're branding a commodity, when you're converting, uh, you know, an object into a commodity, you do it through effect in advertisement. So, I'm not going to go too deep into advertisement studies, although it's a very rich kind of research. Lots of excellent books and articles have been published uh, on looking at advertisements as some kind of an effective study uh, of uh, in a certain social situations, certain cultural conditions and how advertisements can be used uh, as a very faithful representation of what we consume, how we consume, um, and uh, what is the manner of consumption, uh, what is the matter of consumption, uh, and why are we consuming what we consume. Right? And of course, there are other complex questions such as uh, why do certain objects go out of style? Why do certain commodities go out of style? Uh, how do certain commodities come back in style? Okay? So, what we find immediately when we look at advertisement, even a very cursory look at advertisements will reveal uh, that you know, when you are branding a commodity, when you are branding, when you are converting an object into a commodity, what you are essentially doing is you are basically looking at the cultural condition around it and then branding it accordingly. You are constructing it uh, through sentiments, through effect, uh, through a variety of networks uh, in order to appeal to a certain kind of consumer. Okay? Now, of course, uh, what we will find also as we look at these advertisements is there is a very interesting relationship between the effect in advertisements and contemporary value system. Right? Because in other words, what we consume uh, is also dependent on the value system. Uh, what we should consume, what we should not consume, what is good for consumption, what is bad for consumption. So, all this value system, uh, the, you know, the knowledge system uh, of the consumer is very, very important when we look at a certain kind of advertisement. Okay? So, for instance, um, in a culture which forbids alcohol drinking, uh, you know, advertising alcohol consumption would be a negative advertisement because you know it's obviously dependent. Uh, it, it's, it's sort of drawing on a moral system. It's drawing on a moral structure, 
and if it's branding a commodity as alcoholic, then obviously that would go anathema. That, that would be counterproductive because that culture forbids drinking. That culture, uh, you know, it doesn't allow uh, that kind of a practice, that kind of a ritual. So, you know, you can also do a very interesting anthropological ritual study, uh, you know, if you look at advertisements. So, why do certain kind of commodities flourish uh, on certain cultural conditions and don't sell at all in certain other cultural conditions, right? So, there are certain cultural conditions with certain value systems which are very uniquely located, very uniquely situated at that spaces. Right? So, the space, again, we come back to the user word space, which is something which we did already when we looked at you know, Shatnan Chakilari, when we looked at Heart of Darkness, when we looked at uh, in a look back and again, almost all the texts which we covered in this uh, particular course. How, do, how does space create gendered identity? So, how does space create an effect and how does it affect, um, you know, extend onto an identity, right, which is playful, performative and plastic, right? And we will look at uh, one particular slide which is from a film. You know, it's a very important, it's a very interesting film and it's obviously a very uh, famous film. Uh, it's called The Godfather, directed by Francis Ford Coppola and we will see a particular clip from the film at some point later in this last segment of this course, where we look at how the, the, the relation between space and gendered identity is almost directly related to each other. So, how do you behave in a particular way, in a particularly gendered way, uh, in a certain kind of space and how do you behave quite differently uh, if you are relocated to another kind of space, okay. So, again, uh, space is a very loaded term in gender studies because spatial identity is very, very important because it, it sort of certain spaces require or demand a certain kind of embodiment, right? And certain other spaces obviously, you know, demand a different kind of embodiment. So, this demand for a certain kind of embodiment is dependent on your spatial location. Where are you situated at any particular point in time, right? So, these are very complex questions, but these are questions which we need to engage with uh, if we are to do any uh, sophisticated study of gender uh, and its representation in society, culture and politics at large. Now, having given you uh, this idea of space, affective identity, sentiment, association, disassociation and how all these things play out together and creating and recreating identities and selling and commodifying identities which, which appeal to a certain kind of consumer, let us look at a way in which gender becomes sort of dramatically playful, dramatically spectacular uh, in the world of advertisements, right? Because, you know, uh, it's very, we have been talking about so far in this course how uh, human beings are gendered, right? So, how there is a certain kind of masculinity, there is a certain kind of femininity which are contingent on certain political situations. So, you know, uh, the, in a certain political condition, certain cultural condition demand a certain kind of masculinity. Uh, and, you know, likewise certain political and cultural conditions uh, demand a certain kind of femininity. And we were seen, we were looked at how uh, Shatan Sri Kilari by Munshi Premchal, the chess players which we studied uh, as part of the course, uh, it sort of demands whether the relationship between the demand and supply is interrupted. Because the political condition demands certain kind of masculinity which the people in the story fail to deliver. And as a result, they are marginalized and pushed away and in Premchal's story, they die. Uh, it was a very symbolic death because, you know, uh, that, that, that death symbolizes the death of that kind of identity. Right, that kind of gender identity uh, and obviously it paves the way, uh, it indicates, it anticipates a different kind of gender identity which is about to enter the space which as we know uh, what, uh, when we looked at the story is the British imperial masculinity which is about to enter the space of Lucknow and the masculinity on its way out is a feudal Nawabi masculinity you know because of the political changes which um, you know have occurred through the war, through imperialism, uh, through other kinds of economic uh, exploitation, etc. Okay, so space, effect, identity, uh, consumption—all these things are very, very important in gender studies. Particularly, if you look at representations of gender, because obviously the word representation is very important. Is how do you, um, you know, represent gender identities? It's not just—it's it, it not suffice simply to say that okay, this is the way you know, uh, gender operates in a particular space. If you, if you need to look at the representational in politics, so how is gender represented uh, and how do and why do representations change uh, depending on economic conditions, depending on political conditions, depending on consumers conditions, etc. Okay? So, these are the things which you have to bear in mind. And the other thing which we will really be very, very watchful, we will look out for when we read, when we look at these texts as, uh, you know, as case studies of gender is the kind of the politics of stereotypification, right? So, certain kind of gender stereotypes are constructed, uh, are corroborated, are consolidated uh, in certain kinds of advertisements. And likewise, certain other kinds of uh, 
you know, advertisements deconstruct those gender identities. And more importantly, which brings me to the very important point, uh, which is probably the, 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 the most important point in this particular lecture, is how uh, even inanimate objects, things like pen, pencil, uh, you know, pieces of food, uh, you know, products of food, uh, you know, vehicles, etc., uh, you know, these, these are also gendered depending on the cultural social conditions and economic conditions. So, you know, something as inanimate. Uh, you know, as a glass of milk, sometimes something as inanimate uh, as an apple, something as inanimate uh, as a pen. Uh, you know, all these things uh, you know can be gendered, regendered, uh, degendered, uh, in different kinds of conditions, depending, of course, uh, on the contemporary cultural, political, uh, and immediate uh, you know conditions of embodiment. Okay, so even inanimate objects, things which do not live, which do not speak, which do not have any voice. Uh, things which not un quote unquote matter because they are just uh, you know pieces of matter. So, you know even those objects uh, particularly when they are converted into commodities uh, they become gendered right uh, and obviously once you create a certain kind of gender identity out of an object by converting it into a commodity it is also possible perfectly uh, to you know re gender it you know de gender and then re gender it and make it into some kind of other commodity which will be bought and consumed by some other kind of culture, by certain other kind of clientele. Okay? So, again this entanglement between stereotypification and deconstruction uh, of uh, inanimate entities uh, you know, which become gendered very, very quickly, uh, these become very, very important um, this, you know, pieces of analysis uh, when we look at advertisements, particularly in a context of gender. Okay? So, what I will do now is I will go through uh, certain advertisements. Uh, we will mainly do three videos, you know, there are three videos on which you will be asked questions, you know, and I will mention uh, the videos before I play these videos, but for the purpose of giving you a preamble to the other main videos, I will play some other videos which will sort of give you an idea of how the stereotypes are constructed uh, in general identities, how they become important, uh, how they become, you know, uh, you know sometimes subversive, uh, sometimes, um, you know, consolidating. Uh, you know, corroborating a very sexist division of gender, uh, you know, dualism of gender, etc. So, how you know certain kind of advertisements are important because they corroborate the dualism, and likewise, certain other kinds of advertisements are important because they deconstruct the dualism. Okay. So, in other ways, in either ways, uh, dualism is a very important factor uh, in gender, especially if you look at advertisements as a kind of representational politics. Okay. Now, uh, the first video I will play. Uh, when I look at in the relationship between uh, you know gender and identity is something which is very very um, interesting and that is um, the video of a certain kind of alcoholic beverage. Now, obviously as you know alcoholic beverage it first of all the, the first thing we need to know about alcoholic beverage is that it it's, it's not really uh, a commodity which is universally consumed. So, there are certain kinds and again the reason why I am playing this because the questions of uh, race, class, uh, location, uh, you know, all these come into being uh, when we look at the, the gendered politics. Okay, we, we saw when we read Look Back in Anger by John Osborne, we saw how important class is, uh, how important race is uh, when we look at gender. Now, even this advertisement, which uh, sort of advertises a certain kind of alcoholic beverage, uh, is very important because not only should we be looking at the division of gender, uh, we should also be looking at the location of class, the location of race uh, in this particular advertisement. Because you know, this is a certain kind of race, certain kind of class which this advertisement is addressing. And within that race, within that class, we have a division of gender. So, this is the advertisement which we are playing. So, the video will be up in a minute and just take a look and then we will discuss it as we move on. Nou, dit is dus de huiskamer. En dan komen we hier bij de slaapkamer. Oh ja. Met. Okay, so what we saw um, is obviously very, very sexist because what it does very clearly it divides the commodities into a very gendered kind of a thing. So the assumption that we get in the uh, this particular uh, advertisement is that women love shops, uh, love shoes, and men love beer. Uh, men love alcohol, and women love uh, shoes. So again, uh, you know, if you look at the politics of consumption over here, so the assumption is you know women go for certain kind of products 
uh, because they are feminine and men go for certain other kinds of products because they are masculine. So the entire division of masculinity and femininity which is happening not through human beings mind you but through objects, uh, inanimate objects, the bottles of beer or shoes, you know, these don't speak, these don't really uh, have any human gender but you know they are gendered in this particular uh, you know, advertisement and we see many more examples in the times to come. But this brings me to the important point which we started off with when we actually started this course. Uh, that when I said that gender does not really depend on biology, uh, this is exactly what I meant, right. Now, there is no biological you know, division over here, there is nothing biological about a bottle of beer, there is nothing biological about shoes, there is nothing biological about um, necklaces, there is nothing biological uh, about uh, I do not know motorbikes, ok. But th these things are deeply gendered. So, in other words, uh, you know, the gendering of these inanimate objects, the gendering of these commodities do not does not depend on biology because they do not have any biology. You can't really say uh, these are anatomically and organically male or organically and anatomically female. You can't say that about shoe, you cannot say, say that about motorbikes, you cannot say that about uh, you know anything really because these are inanimate objects. But what makes them gendered, what makes them really complexly gendered, especially in a very divisive, dualistic kind of a way, is the way they represent it. Okay. So, the you know and again look at the way how representation and affiliation through sentiment uh, happens in this particular advertisement. Okay. So, the woman walked into a you know a very fancy wardrobe uh, and it's a bunch of women and the, the wardrobe is full, full of uh, very expensive shoes uh, and obviously the women are very pleased they are you know they scream with joy uh, and they they are admiring the wardrobe etc. And then of course, what we see immediately is that is there is a louder shriek there is a louder scream uh, and that is because we have seen men who walked into um, a, a massive fridge full of beer ok. And the assumption is uh, men this is a manly thing uh, you know walking into a fridge of beer and so the screaming uh, you know as men would and again the, the way the men express themselves they are you know they scream more they shout more you know they are wilder they are more physical etc. So, again we find uh, all these things play together in a very interesting way in this particular advertisement. But again this, you know before I move even further on uh, into the politics of gender notice the way in which the consumer I mean who is a consumer of the, this kind of product. I mean we are not talking about uh, you know very old uh, or very poor uh, you know people from um, you know somewhere in, in, in Nigeria where people do not get any food to eat, where people die of cholera and malaria and there are different kinds of diseases. We are not talking about somewhere in Tibet, we are not talking about uh, you know somewhere in you know in a, in a, in a deep interiors of Peru etcetera or we are not talking about somewhere where in a culture where alcohol consumption is banned either religiously or morally or you know emotionally or politically. Uh, the kind of people which you see in this particular advertisement is they are very obviously uh, wealthy white people uh, who belong in an Anglo Saxon world who subscribe or consume an Anglo Saxon moral system and, uh, and I use the word consume quite uh, deliberately it is a really loaded word because you know uh, the advertisement shows two different kinds of consumptions does not it. So, it shows uh, the, the feminine kind of consumption which consumes the shoes the fancy shoes etcetera and it shows the masculine consumption uh, which is supposed to consume uh, and the alcoholic beverage etcetera ok. So, again even the manner of consumption, the politics of consumption, the cultural consumption uh, is deeply gendered ok. And obviously, the clientele for this particular advertisement is um, you know a very wealthy white clientele. Now, the reason why I played this ad in the beginning is you know is it does not take a rocket scientist for you to understand the binary over here. So, the very obvious sexist binary is that men love uh, alcoholic beverage and women love fancy shoes. You know, and obviously, we are talking about white wealthy men and white wealthy women. So, the question of race and class also sort of come in and the questions of race and class also come in when we are talking about gender and divisions of gender and representations of gender in this particular advertisement. So, it is a very important point to remember because you know this is something which we just studied or discussed extensively when we read Look Back in Anger. So, how we can't possibly do a gender reading of Look Back in Anger without bringing the question of class or imperialism or politics or ideology and all that um, in the context of the play. Now, so, this particular advertisement by Heineken uh, you know it, it serves the purpose of corroborating the division between genders right. So, again and this is something which we have been studying from the very beginning of this course. So, if you look back if you go back to uh, Prem Chand's Shatan Shri Kilari or, or the chess players that is something which we saw there you know men you know stay in a certain kind of space women stay in another kind of space uh, and you know it is deeply gendered 
you know, men do certain things, women do certain other things, and the two never crisscross each other. There's hardly a dialogue with each other, uh, and that's deeply gendered as well. It's, but we see something similar happening even in the, in the millennium, the new millennium. So, you know, this is like 2000 uh, and this 21st century, and even then we have this division of labor, this division of consumption, this division of location. So, very clearly location and space becomes uh, a very important factor because if you remember this advertisement, uh, you know, the woman walked into a wardrobe which is supposed to be a quote unquote female space, right? It's a wardrobe full of shoes. So, again, the, the, the location of consumption, the location of appreciation is very, very important. So, it's not as if the men and women standing together and looking at different things. So, the men go into a different thing, the women go into another different thing and they look at different objects uh, which become commodities by default because of the gaze. Uh, the, the way the look is uh, sort of presented. So, we have the difference between the male gaze and the female gaze, but more importantly, uh, you know, the gaze is operative only in a particular site, right. So, the site in the case of the female uh, is that of a massive uh, fancy wardrobe, uh, the site in the case of the male so a, uh, is a massive uh, fancy fridge, uh, you know, full of alcohol and beverage. So, again, uh, the site of appreciation, the site of articulation, uh, the site of reception, the site of consumption. So, all these become very, very important things uh, in terms of the way we look at gender and the way it is represented in this advertisement. Uh, so, um, and the reason why, you know, I, I keep talking about uh, Raise, I keep talking about the class, I keep talking about uh, you know the politics of consumption is, uh, is because you know you cannot possibly divorce, especially if you are looking at advertisements, you cannot possibly divorce away the location of the consumer, uh, the, the quality of the consumer, the, the racial identity of the consumer, uh, the agency of the consumer. So, all these become very important. So, this advertisement will not work at all in a climate where alcohol drinking is prohibited. This will not work at all in a climate where men can't afford um, this kind of drink, where women can't afford this kind of shoes. It, it will only work in a kind of climate, in a kind of economic cultural climate where people tend to buy these things, where people tend to make these divisions, where people tend uh, to subscribe uh, to this kind of a commodity culture. Right? So, it is very important to understand that the location of the, the consumer, the location of the clientele of the advertisement is very important when we look at the politics of representation, especially when it comes to gender and a certain kind of advertisement. Now, so, this is this was an easy ad and I started off as an easy advertisement because you know it is that stereotypical sexist kind of way in which we say only women go for fancy shoes and men go for uh, you know uh, strong uh, you know drinks because they are that's manly and women go for fancy delicate shoes because that is very very feminine. That is something which is very sexist and divisive and dualistic etcetera. There is no you know it is a complete consolidation of commodity difference over here right. So, you know we do not need to be uh, you know overtly uh, aware of the complexities over here. It is not a complex ad at all. So, I deliberately started off with a non-complex ad. It is something which we uh, can understand and associate very, very clearly. But what if and this is important, what if we are looking at a commodity, we are looking at a particular product which is trying to so sort of rebrand itself right, which is trying to break away from the erstwhile branding. So, for instance, if product X uh, used to be branded as feminine. Right and now, the, 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 the company or the product manufacturer wants to open it up to a bigger, wider market. Now, it cannot do it possibly uh, if it contains, if it continues to be feminine only, if it continues to be consumed by the females only. So, what does it need to do? It needs to actually rebrand itself in a way in which it will open up to both the genders, right. So, we are talking about binaries over here right in a very binaristic kind of a way. It will open up, uh, it will appeal to men as well as women, it will appeal to all kinds of genders, it will appeal to a wider audience, it will appeal to you know it will cut across class, it will cut across political location, it will cut across race, it will cut across all kinds of things right. But of course, the other thing which we need to remember is that uh, you know if you look at advertisements, one thing we need to be very aware of or very sensitive to advertisements is every advertisement, every work of advertisement is embedded in a particular moral system. Okay? So, in a moral system where alcohol drinking is forbidden, in a moral system where alcohol drinking is frowned upon, this particular advertisement will be a disaster. Right? So, if you, if you look at it from an advertisement perspective, if a, if a you know, filmmaker's perspective, someone who is making this film uh, for the ad, you know, that particular advertisement will not work at all. Uh, if we are talking about a culture which is you know very conservative, a culture where uh, it is sort of conservative about drinking alcohol etcetera. So, again the moral system 
of the consumer, the model system is very, very important when it comes to uh, you know, gendered representations, uh, especially in advertisements. Okay, now, uh, the next advertisement which I'll play in a minute, it does something more complex and I'm beginning to move from a very simple, sexist, dualistic kind of representation to perhaps a more complex representation which, you know, we ask more questions about them. Now, this particular ad, which stars a very, very uh, you know, popular actor, as you know, uh, you know a very popular uh, you know, footballer. But before I play this, and I'll play another advertisement which will corroborate, uh, you know, which will sort of, again, hammer home the point that you know, a certain kind of branding, a certain kind of gendering is important when it comes to a certain brand. So you know, this is not really an advertisement, but it's sort of a little clip which I'll play, which is an extension of the earlier art which we just saw. So just look at it for a second and then we'll move on to the second advertisement which uh, I'll play. So this is the second clip which we'll see, which is a very simple thing to understand, but it still needs to be played. So this is how it is. Okay, so um, I mean, it's, it's a very simple thing to understand, really. So, what we see over here is a complete example of commodification. So, I use the word commodification quite frequently, and I will use it when I look at advertisements. And the other word which you can use is reification, R E I F I C A T I O N, which means the same thing. To reify something, R E I F Y, uh, is to commodify something. So, everything can be converted into a commodity with a price tag. So, we saw over here. Uh, a footballer, uh, David Beckham, uh, who is sort of everything about him in this particular advertisement is a commodity. So he's wearing a particular jacket which costs something. He's wearing a particular sweatshirt which costs something. Uh, and you know, and again, the whole branding is a very male kind of branding. So it's an all-male space where he enters. You know, uh, where the men have complete control, where the men have agency, where the men have operational skills, and there he sort of gets in and displays this superior masculinity uh, through a very performative act. So, you know, all these little things which we did at the beginning of this course, you know, uh, you know mimicry, performativity, identity formation, etc., agency, so all these things come together and they are sort of displayed spectacularly. Uh, they're embedded in advertisements, and you only have to look out for it, and you know, it's all there. So, this particular advertisement. H&M, you know, which starts David Beckham in it. So it's a very classic example of commodification and also performativity. Because you know, if you look at uh, what happens in advertisement, I'll play it again. So if you look at the, the, the final shot, if you look at uh, you know, the final shot in this particular billiard game, it's a very performative one, right? It's something which is excessive, it's spectacular, it's over the top. Uh, no, no one can possibly do it in a normal circumstances, right? So obviously this is sort of choreographed and it's meant to uh, entertain you, it's meant to uh, fascinate you in a way which is you know, hyper real. So again, the very excessive you know, performative quality uh, of, you know, the act is something which is emphasized, something which is dramatized. So, you know, because it's performative, uh, it is excessive, it is over the top, uh, it is something which happens in a very big way, in a very fashionable way, and in a very stylized way, etc. And that obviously is part of the masculinity package which we see over here. Because you know, he represents a certain kind of masculinity and it's a very privileged masculinity because it's white, it's wealthy, uh, so racially, linguistically, uh, economically, it's a very privileged kind of gendered identity that he displays over here. Right? So this is a continuation. So this to this particular clip or this advertisement as you'd call it is essentially a continuation of the earlier one. The earlier one had this very dualistic understanding of men and women, male and female, uh, the male fantasy and the female fantasy, the male object of desire, the female object of desire, the male kind of consumption, the female kind of consumption. So it's a very binaristic, divisive, dualistic kind of a politics of representation which we saw uh, in the early advertisement. But this one, the H&M one starring David Beckham, uh, so it's a continuation of that. So you know, it looks at a product uh, you know, as a very male, alpha male product. So you know, it, it, it's a kind of a designer 
uh, you know, dress. It's a kind of a designer system, uh, you know, men for men, men not just for men, but for hegemonic men. So the, the, the point is the message is, if you're wearing this product, if you're wearing this kind of dress, you are essentially privileged. You are essentially in a position of power. You are essentially in a position of authority. And uh, if you want to take all these words together, the word which you've been looking for is agency. You are in a position of superior, you know, authorized agency. So authority and agency are something which are linked together in this particular advertisement. So, so this is a simple ad as well. Uh, something which you know is, is very easy to understand. How does it work? It's very easy to understand why this would be popular, uh, and it's very easy to understand what the product or the manufacturer of the product is trying to get at. So if you wear this, uh, you are a performative, superior, you know, hegemonic man. Right, you you are embodying that kind of masculinity. Now we'll see another ad later, uh, and that's one of the text ads. And I mentioned that uh, it's a text ad because you can expect questions from it, uh, you know, in your examination. We will see that particular ad later. Uh, we find that you know it sort of deconstructs the the relationship between commodity and masculinity. Now this one, the Beckham ad, it sort of establishes the relationship between commodity and masculinity. So if you wear this commodity, you are a superior man. You already were a superior man, but you become a more superior man, and just by wearing this particular commodity, by consuming this particular commodity. Okay, so. The first two advertisements which you have seen today in this particular lecture, they are so simple, simplistic, uh, binaristic, sexist, uh, in a very you know heavy-handed kind of a way, because you know they play on the dualism of man and woman, male and female, etc. Right? Because they are talking about products which are definitely uh, sort of belong to a certain kind of gendered location. So they are talking about products such as shoes uh, and beer, they are talking about products such as you know leather jackets uh, and very, very manly garments. And obviously, the whole idea is they, they belong to certain gendered locations. Now, the next ad, which I'll play in a minute, does something more complex. Uh, it stars a very popular Indian actor, uh, Shah Rukh Khan, uh, in a very interesting angle because you know this the commodity that has been that he has been trying has been you know uh, the actor is trying to sell over here uh, through the advertisement, through the narrative of the advertisement, is not traditionally a male commodity. Right? It's, it, it used to be gendered in a different kind of way. It used to be gendered uh, in, a, in a female kind of a way. Now, what this advertisement tries to do, uh, what this advertisement attempts to achieve uh, through its, its process of representation is to debrand the product uh, you know, from the very essentialized female kind of product and then rebrand it as something which is masculine. So, the advertisement is that of a fair and handsome cream. Now, fair and handsome cream is something of a recent phenomenon uh, in the advertisement market, especially in India. Because you know, prior to that, you had uh, you know, fair and lovely cream, you had fairness creams for women, uh, because the entire idea was that it's only women who need to look fair, it's only women uh, you know, who need to look beautiful. Uh, men don't, lead, don't need fairness, men don't need beauty, because that's a manly thing to do. You know, not needing to be beautiful is manly you know, uh, by that particular moral standard. Now, of course, you know, what we find with the introduction of the new kind of creams where men need to look beautiful, where men need to look fair, where men need to look handsome is because you know, a certain kind of moral system has changed where it is okay for men, it is actually desirable for men uh, to look beautiful and handsome and fair and, and all the rest of it. So, division you know, which was there you know, earlier you know, in terms of fairness, so it's only women who need to be fair and men can be whatever, that division uh, begins to give away uh, and we have a very com more, more complex situation where fairness can also belong to men as well as to women. However, this is a caveat in the ad and this is what I am trying to get at. Uh, it, it, it can't possibly say that it is the same kind of fairness, right. It can't possibly say this is a fairness, you know, this is the same fairness, you know, which is uh, desired by the woman. So, but what it does say instead is that this is a kind of fairness which is just purely men for men, right. So, in other words, if you are using the fair and lovely cream, uh, the old fairness cream, that is not going to work because you are still a man, right. And you need to be fair but in a manly kind of a way. So, the product tries to say that, you know, this is a cream which will make you fair because it is okay to be fair, it is desirable to be fair. However, the fairness process will be achieved only in a very manly way. 
So the manliness of the process is something which is uh, interesting and something which we we'll look at when we study this particular ad. So, and, and there are more complex questions as well. There's, there's, a, co there's a question of uh, you know class. There's a question of uh, you know, societal location. Uh, so, what class is being addressed over here? Uh, what kind of uh, location is being addressed over here? Whether it's an urban location or a rural location? What kind of value system is addressed over here? So, all these questions are coming to me because I remember this is something I've been telling you from the very beginning of this course. You can't possibly look at gender as a divorced um, abstract phenomenon. So, along with gender, the questions of class, the questions of identity, questions of caste, questions of political locations, all these things will come in in a very heavy way. And even this particular advertisement does something quite complex and of course in a very regressive way. But you know, we are looking, we, we're looking at this as a text, we are looking at all these as text. So, we are not so judging them as progressive or regressive. So, we are looking at how the different gendered codes and it is a very coded system of course. So, how this very coded quality of gender formation and identity formation. So, how, how do these codes play out uh, in this particular advertisement. So, how are these codes recoded right and then of course, decoded and recoded and then you know rebranded in different commodities etcetera. So, commodity formation and codification they are very similar processes. So, the process through which an object becomes a commodity is a very codified process and we look at how that codified process works in this particular advertisement. So, this is a fair and handsome cream advertisement uh, starring uh, the Indian actor Shah Rukh Khan. So, this is how it goes. Oh, Belavan, you're going to get a fairness cream. You're going to get a nail polish. You're going to get a person lipstick. You're going to get a lingo. Belavan. फेयर एंड हैंडसम लगा मर्दों की त्वचा होती है सख्त जिस पे लड़कियों वाली फेयरनेस क्रीम बेअसर सिर्फ इमामी फेयर एंड हैंडसम में है अमेरिकन लुमिनो पेप्टाइड जो किसी भी साधारण मर्दों वाली फेयरनेस क्रीम से ज्यादा असरदार ज्यादा फास्ट इमामी फेयर एंड हैंडसम दुनिया की नंबर 1 फेयरनेस क्रीम मर्दों के लिए ओके सो सो एज वी कैन सी आई मीन इफ यू रीड इन वाचिंग दिस केयरफुली I mean, it is a very complex text, a lot of things are happening in this text. So, the first sight of the text is a very rural uh, wrestling uh, arena, is an agam where we have very uh, muscular men who probably belong to a certain kind of uh, you know societal location, they are practicing wrestling etcetera, not in a fancy gymnasium, but in a uh, village mat, in a village uh, agam ok. So, this is where this is where the story starts uh, in this particular advertisement. Now, we find there a particular wrestler, uh, a very manly wrestler of course, uh, he is sort of trying to put you know a certain kind of fairness screen which is uh, reprimanded, which is sort of frowned upon because uh, it is sort of described as a the, the female fairness screen which should not work, which you know it is not supposed to work for men. And the way uh, he is reprimanded for using that particular cream is a very visual kind of a way. So, first of all the actor comes and tells him that you know how dare you put on uh, the female fairness cream. So, if you replay it you, you, you watch it again and you find it as a really rich text, uh, very complex text of course, it is very regressive, but that is that is the whole point right. Now, uh, the actor comes and tells the wrestler that how dare you put on the uh, female fairness cream because you know the next thing you know you are probably putting on lipstick, you are probably putting on nail polish uh, and the whole process is parody, the whole process is sort of uh, it becomes a very grotesque comedy as you saw in the advertisement right. So, he is almost uh, sort of penalized for putting on the female fairness cream because the whole idea is you know you you essentially emasculating yourself you are not really manly anymore because you know the whole point of putting on a female fairness cream is a process of emasculation and that is something that is sort of really really frowned upon by the actor in this particular uh, piece of advertisement. So, what does it suggest instead? He says if you really are to be fair which is a fine thing uh, you know fairness is a very desirable thing for men as well, but the whole point is if you really are to be fair you need to use uh, a, a particular cream which is meant for the male skin. So, you should not be using the fair and lovely cream, what you should be using is a fair and handsome cream because the word handsome remember and again this is a very old thing which we have been talking about for a long time, there are certain adjectives which are gendered as well. Now, it is very rare that you call a woman handsome although you could grammatically right. There is nothing ungrammatical about calling a woman handsome right. So, it is not grammatically incorrect 
if you call a woman handsome. But you know, it's more conventional to call a man handsome because you know that's the kind of way the adjective has evolved to a very gendered process, right? So you know, the fair and handsome queen is a very important uh, distinction from the fair and lovely queen because again, the word lovely uh, is sort of quote unquote more feminine. Uh, you, you very rarely would call a man lovely, a lovely looking man. Uh, you know, it's not really quote unquote manly in a stereotypical, conventional, conservative kind of a way. So again, look at the way how the signifiers change from lovely to handsome. The words change, the adjectives change, uh, and of course, uh, through the process, through the process of the sign changing, uh, the letters have changed, etc., uh, the branding is also being changed. So, it's a process of debranding and then rebranding. So, you know, the actor tells the wrestler in the end that, you know, if you really are to be fair, which is a great thing, you should aspire to be fair through a manly process. So, put on a fair and handsome cream, which it does. So, thanks to the actor's advice, he does put on the fair and handsome cream, and it, the, the effect is immediate, it's immediately desirable. So, you know, and interestingly, which, what we find in the end of the advertisement is that, uh, you know, he's sort of putting on you know, a green t shirt, is wearing a jeans, which is a complete contrast uh, to the, what he was wearing uh, at the beginning of the advertisement. So, at the beginning of the advertisement, he was wearing just this really red short. Uh, you know, you know, which was which is sort of worn by uh, professional wrestlers, and he's obviously bare-bodied. Uh, the torso was bare, and he was wearing red shorts. And in complete contrast, and a really dramatic contrast to that, we find in the end of the advertisement that he's wearing a green T-shirt with jeans, and not just that, he's got a bag on his slung on his shoulders, and he's walking out. Uh, and there's a there's a there's a group of women uh, who are looking at him very admiringly, and are singing a very sort of a choric song, uh, calling him fair and handsome. Right? So, uh, it's not just about gender and it's something you know, I should be telling you and obviously most of you would know by now, it's not just about gender that we're talking about, it's not just about manning up uh, using a particular uh, product, it's also about mobility. So, what we find over here is an example of social mobility. So, this particular person moves from becoming a very rural less wrestler into this sort of quasi cosmopolitan, uh, you know, metropolitan man uh, who is presumably uh, going to a college, uh, is, you know, is wearing a jeans, uh, you know, uh, uh, jeans trousers and, and a green t shirt. So, obviously, that is an indicator, a signifier of some kind of a social mobility, urbanity. Uh, it's more, he's more urbane now compared to what he was at the beginning of the, the, the particular advertisement. So, all these things come together and, and suggest a very interesting social study. Uh, so, if you look at advertisements, and obviously, this is the, the, the key thing. Uh, advertisements are very rich social text. They tell you a lot uh, about that particular social culture. Uh, they tell you a lot in terms of, you know, what's happening to society, how is society evolving. Uh, so, what's the contemporary social system? What's the contemporary model system? Uh, so, what kind of a uh, consumerist morality do you have in that particular system? You know, you know if, you, if you look at this advertisement, the immediate implication is, uh, you know, this is a bit of a changing India where men need to look uh, fair. So, it is not just enough that you are wrestling and you have a very muscled body, it is also important that you are fair. But of course, uh, if, if you are fair through a female process, a quote unquote female process, uh, it is the process of emasculation and you are parodied and penalized for it. Uh, and of course, we, if you remember the images where he is putting on lipstick, uh, where he is putting on a very crude nail polish and that so, and, and he is also wearing a frock at one point, it is a bit of a visual sequence which you see in the advertisement. So, he is putting on a frock, so he is instead sort of, of wrestling with the wrestler, he is dancing with the wrestler wearing a frock. So, the whole thing becomes a grotesque parody of masculinity. So, you know, that is being, uh, you know, very, very quickly shut down uh, and of course, the way to promote yourself is through a manly process. So, the fairness cream which emerges in the end is a fair and handsome cream which he puts on uh, and in the process, uh, he becomes a truly man, a truly manly in a metropolitan kind of a way. So, it is not just about uh, masculinity, uh, it is not just about masculinity and femininity, it is also about mobility. So, the, the product promises not just uh, urbane masculinity, it also promises mobility, it also promises a social mobility. It also sort of tells you that you know if you use this product, uh, you know you are not just becoming uh, a good looking man, you are becoming uh, a sort of a more mobile man, you are becoming a more desirable man. So, and that is a very important point. So, this is what the product does. Uh, and it, so, aims to achieve, whether it achieves or not is a different question, but it aims to achieve uh, through this uh, digestive process in the advertisement film. So, the three ads which we have seen so far, and I am sort of concluding now, the three ads which you have seen so far, uh, they do very similar as well as dissimilar things. So, the first advertisement which you saw 
which was a Heineken uh, beer advertisement, it sort of looks at a certain kind of beverage, a certain kind of uh, culture of consumption. Right? Uh, and it's a very binaristic, divisive kind of a culture of consumption. So the, the obvious assumption is, as I mentioned, the automatic assumption is, uh, it's only the women uh, who wear fancy shoes and men don't wear fancy shoes. Men couldn't care less about fancy shoes. And it's only the men who drink uh, you know, alcoholic beverage and women don't drink alcoholic beverage at all. Uh, and it's obviously uh, the euphoria of the woman is drowned immediately by the euphoria of the men. The men are even more joyous at the sight of beer than they are at the sight of uh, in a wardrobe. And again, uh, the, the location is very important, space is very important over here, as I keep saying. Uh, so, the, the speciality of the wardrobe is very, very female, it's very, very feminized uh, in this particular advertisement. Whereas, the speciality of the alcohol fridge, uh, the fridge full of alcohol, is sort of masculinized, it's something of a manly space, etc. It's a very divisive kind of a representation of politics, which we saw in the advertisement. Now, the second advertisement starring um, David Beckham, which was an H&M advertisement, it was a manly designer dress uh, kind of a product which we saw. And of course, it's an extension of the first advertisement in the sense that, you know, it's, it's trying to commodify and consolidate a certain brand of masculinity, wealthy white masculinity. Uh, and the assumption is, if you are consuming this product, if you are wearing this product, uh, you know, if you are subscribing to this product, then you obviously, uh, you know, hegemonic by default, you know, you belong to this hegemonic gendered location by default, you know, uh, not just because of your biological location, but also because of your racial, your political, your ethnic location, okay. So, all these things come together as well. The third advertisement which you saw is perhaps the most complex one of the three, where we saw uh, how a particular kind of masculinity, uh, you know, rural wrestling kind of masculinity, uh, you know, it tries to surreptitiously, it tries to, uh, you know, make itself more fair at the man, uh, you know, by using, you know, because it's ignorant, it doesn't know what's happening in the consumer world, he's using an old fairness cream for women, you know, the cream for women is a cream for men, and the idea over here, what, what the advertisement wants to show, is that the men's skin are different, so the creams are different. So, the skin and cream thing are equated over here in terms of the politics of difference. So, the uh, advertisement tells us uh, of the wrestler inside the advertisement who is a hearer and the consumer as well, uh, the listener and the consumer as well, that you know, if you are to be uh, in a fair, you should do it through a manly process. So, if you are doing it, you know, if you are going for this fairness process through uh, using female products, then you are parodied and penalized, that it is like wearing lipsticks, uh, it is like wearing uh, you know, a frock in a wrestling match, it is like wearing a uh, you know, nail polish in a very, you know, crude kind of a way. So, the whole idea is to parody, you know, and these are not, you know, quote unquote prestigious things, these are not really manly things, these are not really respectable things, and these are uh, laughable things. So, again, you are being laughed at, uh, you know, you are being laughed at because you are doing the wrong thing, you are doing a stupid thing, you are actually subscribing to a wrong code of gender. Now, if you are to subscribe to a right code of gender, you should go for a fair and handsome cream, because the word handsome is important, it is a manly word. So, so is the product. So, a fair and handsome cream will make you handsome in a manly kind of a way. And not just that, it will also make you upwardly mobile. It will give you some kind of a social mobility upwards. Because, you know, at the end of the advertisement, we find that instead of being a wrestler, uh, instead of continuing to being a wrestler, it is presumably uh, going for some kind of a you know, is probably going to college or something. Is wearing you know green green uh, uh, a green shirt, green t-shirt, and, and a jeans, and he's got a um, you know little bag slung on his shoulder, which is indicator that maybe he's going for some kind of an educational program. Not only he's not just wasting his time uh, in a wrestling agon, and there's a there's a group out, there's a row of women uh, who is admiring him, uh, you know, calling him fair and handsome. So again, the whole package of uh, location, societal location, uh, whether it's a rural location or urban location, uh, class, um, ethnicity, race, the common to being. And of course, mind you, the most fundamental thing is, this is a culture uh, which uh, sort of worships fairness. This is a culture which appreciates fairness. This is a culture which is which wants to consume fairness. Now, again, when I said in, in, in the beginning, uh, the first advertisement that the Heineken beer advertisement will not work in a very sort of in a culture where alcohol drinking is forbidden. 
because there is a model system there uh, you know against which this particular advertisement will not work because the, the, the kind of spirit that advertisement wants to sell is completely in conflict with a model map that certain people certain locations will have. Now, likewise, the fair and handsome cream will not work in a white world because in a white world no one would care to be handsome in a, through a fair process. Right? In a white world, no one would care to be handsome by becoming fair. So, the, the equation between handsomeness and fairness uh, will not work in a white world. So, this, this particular advertising will not work in Europe. This particular advertisement will not work in Northern America and any other part of the white world. So, I am using the word white in a sort of a racial kind of a way. It will only work in a racial location where fairness is desirable, uh, you know, in other words, a non white space. Now, interestingly, in a white space, you might get a similar advertisement for a tanning cream because, you know, to get the skin tanned uh, as a white person is a desirable thing because, you know, it's, it's, it, it makes you more attractive uh, in that kind of a moral, uh, you know, erotic parameter, in that, can, that kind of a gaze, it makes you more attractive. But, you know, in this particular uh, map, in this particular moral system, becoming white, uh, becoming fair, becoming desirable. So, again uh, the, the, I will conclude with this you know we are looking at some very interesting uh, and complex correspondences between gendered identity, moral identity, moral location, gendered location, economic location, uh, you know societal location all these things coming together. So, you know you cannot really pick up one uh, and shred away everything else because you know they are all linked together in a very asymmetric kind of a way. So, you do not quite know what, what ends and when the other begins etcetera. It is all entangled together in a very heavy uh, a complex process. So, hopefully, you know you, you, you enjoyed watching these advertisements and you treat these advertisements as text uh, for your course. Uh, and of course, I will mention which of the texts you should be treating as examination texts. So, none of these texts will be uh, you know, used as examination texts, but this is just to give you an idea uh, of the kind of uh, culture, the visual culture, uh, you know, consumer culture uh, that uh, certain advertisements want to promote a uh, very gendered uh, and coded idea of identity. Okay? So, this concludes the first lecture of the last segment of gender and literature, which is about advertisements and popular culture and films, etcetera. So, in the next lecture, I will show you more advertisements and we will talk a little more, more about how gender locations and configurations uh, are played and replayed depending on the moral, societal, and ideological uh, climates. So, thank you for your attention, and I will see you in the next class.